Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for all the folks that you brought out here tonight. I just pray, Father, that we um, that we accept all this, all your your wisdom in these stories, and that we um, that we take it to heart, and that we take it outside these doors. Uh, the wilderness out there is where you told us to go and to proclaim. And so, Father, I just pray that um, that tonight that everybody learns a little something or takes in a little something that they can take out there in the world with them. Uh, Father, bless this time that we have together. Uh, watch over us. Place a hedge of protection around this, around this body. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so tonight uh, we're going to start in John chapter 11. And we'll start with verse 1 in chapter 11. And before we get started, uh, just give you a little information here. Our last, uh, or this is our last of the seven uh, miracles in the Gospel of John, and they're all the miracles have got a depth of wisdom, and uh, the majority of all the stories throughout the Bible have a uh, have a depth of wisdom to them, but this particular one of Lazarus is um, it's profound. I mean, it's there's so much here we could spend days if not months getting into all this and everybody would get something else get something different out of it and so as we're going through this one and as we go through the next story i want i'm, I'm trying to take y'all through this story for a specific purpose and see a specific a specific perspective and so um as we're going through it you're going to see me kind of just run over some of the good meat that's there and and I, you read through it and and come to come to our bible studies we'll go back over it in a different different way and we'll dig into all that stuff but tonight uh, like i said i've got a i've got a specific thing in mind and uh, that's where we're headed so uh, let's get after it um all right so 11 verse 1 says that now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany. The village, <clears throat> the village that Mary and her sister Martin, <laughs> excuse me, that's a rough start. Let me start this over. Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, uh, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sister sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard, heard it, he said, The sickness will not end in death, but is for the, for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So I'll stop. The direction in which I'm taking you is right there in verse number four, in that last part. All of this that we're fixing to go through is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. The reason I'm pointing this out is, this is all God's plan. And so, what is the plan? We go back to the very first words of verse 1. The man, Lazarus, became sick. Now, back then, uh, you didn't have a lot of ointments for everything, we, or, or uh, medicines for what ailed you. We went over some of that last week. And... Um, when Jesus started his ministry and was going through, uh, going throughout the land, he was healing thousands, if not tens of thousands of people. And uh, he was just vanquishing uh, illness and, and um, uh, disease as he was going through there. If you think about like the coronavirus, right? It started in one spot and then it spread. Jesus started in a spot and his healing spread just like that. So anyway, um, so this is all for the glory of God and so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So a little bit of a backstory, not much, but right here in verse 5, Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. And if you read back about the accounts that involve uh, these three people, 
uh, they did. They had a very deep relationship. They were not pen pals. They weren't fishing buddies. They were nothing like that. They had a very deep relationship. And so, um, verses 6 and 7. So, when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. After that, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea. So, the plan takes an unexpected turn here. Instead of you or me or anybody, I hope, in this room, uh, instead of getting the news that our loved one was sick and taking off to be by their side or doing anything that we can to help, uh, Jesus stopped. He, he did not make the move that we all would expect him to make. But if the move that we would expect him to make, we have to realize, is not a move that he needed to make in the first place. Uh, if you look in uh, John 4, uh, 46 through 54, that's his second miracle. And uh, that's when he healed the official son. And he did that from a distance of 15 or so miles. And so all he had to do was will to want it to be done, basically, and it would have been done. And it, this all goes back to uh, verse 4, that this is all for the glory of God and so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So anyway, moving on to verse 8, he says, uh, the disciples say, Rabbi, just now the Jews tried to stone you and you're going there again. That happened two months ago. Jesus was over it and they were still dwelling on it. In verse 9, aren't there 12 hours in a day? Jesus answered, if anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during night, during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. He said this, and then he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way to wake him up. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll get well. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death, but they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So he told, so Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and I'm, going, and I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Miss Billy, I believe uh, last week when I was here, you asked me about charisma, if Jesus had charisma. And I took that as uh, differing personalities. Right, so him being angry at times, being happy at times, and all this and that. So I want to read that again. Jesus tells his disciples in verse 7, let's go to Judea. His disciples come up with, a, with an excuse of why they need to stay where they are. I don't know if where they were was a comfort zone to them or, or what the deal was, but they weren't being persecuted and nobody was trying to kill them just like that, what did happen over in Judea. So Jesus tried to tell them nicely in his own way. And when he did, uh, and he tells them, Lazarus has fallen asleep, and I'm on my way to wake him up. They tell him again, Lord, you, look, we don't need to go. He's asleep. And if he's sleeping just like you or me, when we have a fever or something and it breaks, we can finally get some rest. They saw the sleep as a... Um, as a good sign for he's going to get over it, he'll be fine. I guarantee you, when he told them that, I'm on my way to wake him up, he left them, took a couple of steps and heard those words, and turned right back around and said, look, he has died, and I'm going to wake him up. Get up, let's go. And it was one of those things, you know, it's just like any of us, uh, if you have a, um, all of us work, and when we, or have worked, and, you know, sometimes you have good days, sometimes you don't, and sometimes the people who should know their job, it's like they come to work brain dead, and they don't have any clue of what's going on, and after you tell them once or twice, and then they still don't, you know, they still don't get it, it's, come on, you know, it's, it's, let's go, it, whatever, but anyway, um, so then in verse 16, Thomas called twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go to so that we may uh, die with him. Um, in verse 17, he says, When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus 
Now, this was a day's journey between 16 and 17. So anyway, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away, and many of the Jews had come, come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And 22 says, Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And Martha says to him, I know that he will rise, will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, if you've read about Martha and Mary, you know this is very um, common for, for what was going on. Uh, Martha was the Martha was the doer. She was going. She was a, she was task oriented, and she was always uh, always had a job to do, and she was always uh, being a busybody. And uh, Mary was more subtle. She was more uh, I guess stoic. You could you could say she was calm. She was collective, and. And here, when she sees him, these words will be echoed uh, here in just a little bit. But I want you to take note that after she says, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. A lot of people look at, or a lot of people when they read that, they think that she says that out of anger. And that's just not the case. She says that out of, out of grief, out of mourning, that she had lost her brother. And knowing that Jesus could have been there, because they, they know about Jesus, they love Jesus, they, they trusted in Jesus, that she knows that he could have done something. Yet now, I'm, and she says, yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. She had full faith in God. She had full faith in everything that she had learned from Jesus. She just lost her focus on Jesus. She put her belief and her understanding above what Jesus above what God's plan was and what Jesus was there to do. And we do that all the time. The difference in the situations is she had the Son of God right there with her to question and to, to talk to about all this. We have to trust in the faith that we have and move forward the best way that we can in his will that we know. Um, verse 25. So like I said, She's not right where she needs to be, and Jesus, Jesus does exactly what he's always done, as, as, as gentle and as nice as he can. Verse 25, he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Who comes into the world so he gently he didn't rebuke her he gently reminded her who he was the power that he had without telling her what was fixing to happen so kind of baited the hook I guess you could say and then she in in response she told him everything that he had been there teaching her that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who comes into the world to, um, to take away our sins, to take away our judgment. In verse 28, having, having said this, she went back in, to her sister uh, Mary, saying in private, and that's very important, in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. She wanted Mary to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with her with her messiah um so fully he would comfort her the way uh, martha was comforted in 29 as soon as mary heard this she got up and quickly went to him and jesus had not yet come into the village but was still in the place where martha had met him the jews who had the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to cry there. As soon as Mary came to Jesus, she saw him 
Oh, well, wait a minute. Let me stop right there. Just so you know, when somebody passed back then, there was a 30-day grieving process where uh, even the poorest among, among the people had at least two mourners and a, uh, somebody that played a musical instrument. And so uh, these people that were there, they were there uh, out of love for Mary and Martha and out of support. And for, for her to leave abruptly the way she did, see, the first seven days of this mourning process were obviously the most intense, but that's when the most people were there the most people were uh, were taking care uh, of the people who had lost someone. And so this is not out of the ordinary. All this this that has taken place is a, is a normal proceeding. But the in private part is what is what I want y'all to focus on. So as soon as Mary came to where Jesus was, she saw him. She fell she fell at his feet and told him, "Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died." And Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying. And he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. So again, people like to say she was mad. She was not mad. She was grieving. She was heartbroken. And she had her faith in Jesus. And that has never, never, uh, uh, never failed, never, never faltered. Uh, whenever we went over this in the men's Bible study, uh, my son blew my mind, actually, because I asked the question, and he actually answered it. So where was the first time that you, that you remember hearing about Mary in the Bible? It was when she came up behind Jesus and cried at his feet and wiped her tears away, washing his feet with her tears and her hair. So that's where, that's where Mary started, and that's where Mary is right now and in the future. It, it does not change. Mary's, Mary's um, conviction is as strong as anybody's ever has been. And so don't take it for a second that she was mad. She was upset, but she wasn't mad. So Jesus asked, Jesus asks, where have you put him? Lord, they told him, come and see. And Jesus wept. I think at this moment, they're, they're somewhere in a, new, in a, I guess you could call a, uh, a neutral position, right? So you got, a, you got the town where, where Mary and Martha had come from. Jesus hadn't made it in there yet. And the tomb was somewhere over here. And so at this moment where, where it says Jesus wept, I truly think that when they told him, <coughs> when they told him, Lord, come and see. He wrapped his arm around Mary and started towards where the tomb was. And so, um, again, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also, who could also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb, and it was a cave. A stone was laying against it. Now, hold on. This is where things are really fisting to take a turn. So, again, Mary in his arm, they went to the tomb. And everything is normal. Everything, uh, they don't know why Jesus is here outside of um, mourning, grieving, and being supportive of, the, of his loved ones. So there's a crowd among them. And the part that I was talking about in private back up here in verse 28, Martha may have wanted it to be private. Mary may have wanted it to be private, may have preferred it so. And going into what we're fisting to get into, definitely more than likely. But God had a different plan. God didn't want it to be a private uh, conversation or a private meeting. He wanted all the eyes to be there to see what was fishing to happen. So, verse 39, remove the stone, Jesus says. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there is already a stench. He has been there, or he, is, he has been dead for four, de for, for four days. She panics. So basically, she screams, stop, no. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> we, I don't need to tell you what a uh, corpse would look like after four days and or smell like. Um, she, again, 
uh, is blinded by her own understanding and does not know what is fixing to take place. Nobody does. I mean, what do you? What could you imagine? Jesus or anybody else is going to do in this situation. And prior to what he just said, maybe give a eulogy, say some say some nice words, and let's have a prayer and let's you know go eat dinner or whatever the case may be. Jesus said to her. Didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? Again, a gentle reminder that it's okay, I've got control. Verse 41, they removed the stone. Now, when they removed the stone, and I, I don't mean to be crude about this at all, I want you to understand exactly what's going on. When they removed that stone, the smell of that corpse came out because at that point in time, he was still dead for four days. He was not raised until about two verses ahead of us here. So there is still a dead man laying in that tomb. He looks up. He raised his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you heard me and I know that you always hear me. But because the crowd is standing here, I say this so that they may believe that you sent me. After this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, bound hand and foot, in linen strips and his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. So, Jesus gave the command to rise up and step out. What you have to realize here is that this plan, although the turns that it took, the, the hills and valleys that it went through, all the, all the unthinkable things that, that, that we've gone through in this, and then the things that we don't know, because there's a lot of gaps here to fill in that, that we just can't know. This plan and, the, and God's timing in all of this is the point. There was a man who, whom Jesus loved. And if Jesus loved him, you know God loved him. He laid there with his family suffering for, we don't, for an unknown amount of time. You would think at least a couple of days, if not a week. And then he finally passes. And the Jewish, uh, the people back then, they believed that you had some kind of a a life spirit, right? And it, it was different from your spirit and your soul and what reigned or what uh, eternally went to heaven or hell. And so, but the point that I'm making is, is that they thought that after three days, you were a lost case. Anything that happened within those three days, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no, we don't know. But at the fourth day, there, that was it. it, it you're a lost cause and we're going we're gonna to mourn over you and go on. Jesus waited that four days to prove to everybody that he is who he claimed to be. And in doing so, the testimony that was, that was given, the gift of the testimony that was given throughout this story, not only to Lazarus, who had literally laid there dead for four days, but the family members who prepared his body and the people that, that put him in there and situated him on his final resting place. All these testimonies of the people that opened the, that opened the tomb and the, the whiff that they got out of that tomb, the testimonies, they, the testimonies that they have, God gave. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that God has a plan for this world and all of us in it. Our part is to keep focused on the Savior. And remember, verse 25, he says that, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. We will never see death. We will never we will never suffer what so many have and will. So even when it seems that all hope is lost, no matter the turns, no matter the hills that you got to climb, 
you have to remain like Martha and just keep telling, keep saying that, yes, Lord, I do believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world, verse 27. And in doing so, like Lazarus and all those around him, we will have a testimony that will move hearts for, a kingdom, for the kingdom of God as long as we get up and we step out at the command of Christ. So that's what I've got for Lazarus tonight. And again, like I said when we got started, this is one of those stories, uh, just like the prodigal son, just like so many more. No matter what season you are, you're in in life, you can go back and read this story and get something new out of it. It's so deeply, it's, it's just so profound. Uh, it's so deep with wisdom. But now I want to take you to a different story. And this is going to be in Mark chapter 5. Yes, ma'am. You know, when I when I did this Bible study in the men's in the in the men's part, I found a couple of different explanations for that. Uh, one talks back about how uh, the last time they were in Judea, they threatened to stone Jesus and kill him, um, and so some people think that. Uh, some people think that it was Lazarus. It was Lazarus's death that they were talking about. Let us go, so that we may die with him. And to be honest with you, I really don't know. And I believe that that is truly up to interpretation. Uh, and it's, like I said, the season in life in which you're at, at the point in time you go through it, you can look at it a hundred different ways. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And there's so much about Lazarus, about this story, like, uh, one of the ladies here at church stopped me Sunday morning and said that um, that she heard she heard it interpreted as Lazarus is ever one of us living a sinful life, dying and being reborn in Christ, and you know coming out of the grave and doing doing our part. Um, when me and Jamie went to a uh, a marriage conference, and it was about the time I was going over the story of Lazarus, and they were talking about the grave clothes. They were talking about how whenever you settle something with your spouse, with your loved one, that you leave all that junk behind you. When you come out of that, you leave it, you leave it behind you. And to call it out, if not, because if you don't call it out to your spouse, whatever those grave clothes are, they can't take them off. And so, like I said, there's so many different perspectives on like this particular story that it, it's unreal. So is there anything else anybody's got for Lazarus? Okay. Well, let's go to Mark. Yes, in uh, chapter 12, which you got to keep coming to Bible study, uh, there, is a, there, is another, um, there is another deal with Lazarus later on in the future. It's, it's kind of a short story, but, but yeah, yeah, there sure is. And that's another thing. Somebody, I can't remember exactly who, uh, was saying that they didn't realize that Lazarus lived a full life afterwards. And he did. When he was resurrected, any and everything that ailed him, he was fully restored. He came out of that better than he ever was. But he also came out of the best place we could ever imagine being to be brought back. And uh, a guy told me one time that the reason Jesus wept is because he knew where Lazarus was and what he was taking out, taking him out of to put him back in too. So again, multiple different ways you can think about it. So uh, let's look at, at Mark chapter 5, and this is a little bit shorter uh, of a story. And the reason I picked this as our, I guess, number 8 miracle is... Uh, there's five categories of miracles that Jesus performed. And I should have wrote it down because I feel a little, um, I guess not so Mike Blumish, not knowing all my information. But anyway, um, there's five different types. And the only one that is not in John is uh, exorcism, driving out demons. And so the one that I picked here tonight is... Uh, 
is is a very good one that I that I when I when I went over this one the first time, it really struck me. And so uh, this one's only twenty verses, so I'm going to read through it, and then we'll go back uh, and we'll break down the the first part and the last part because I truly believe if you if you dig into it, the point that I'm making tonight is the first part and the last. So. Anyway, verse uh, or chapter five, verse one. Oh well, let me give you a little bit of a background first. So the first time that Jesus healed, uh, calms the wind and the waves, it had just happened. So the guys were in the boat. They were they had left a crowd and they were coming across the Sea of Galilee, and this big big wind kind of started up, and um, it got real rough. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a pillow, right? And that's when they this when they went up and woke him up and was like, "Don't you even care that we're all about to die?" You know, all the fishermen, they're turned to the carpenter for help. You know, that was the big that was the joke of that whole deal. Um, so anyway, Jesus wakes up, he calms the wind and the waves, and then they make their way to the shoreline, and that's where this is uh, this is picking up. So, but, uh, chapter five, verse one. They came to the other side of the sea, to the region of uh, Gerasens. We'll say that, Gerasens. We're from Texas. We can, get, we can get away with mispronouncing things. Some of us are from Texas. Excuse me. <laughs> so, <laughs> verse 2. Yes, ma'am. Um. So as soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. He lived in the tombs, and no one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, He was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt down before him and cried out with a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you before God, do not torment me, for he had told him, Come out of the the man, you unclean spirit. What is your name? Jesus asked him. My name is Legion, he answered him, because we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the region, not to send them out of the region. A large herd of pigs were there feeding on a hillside. The demons begged him, send us into the pigs, send us to the pigs so that we may enter them. So he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered into the pigs. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down a steep bank into the sea and drowned there. All right, let's stop. Because as I was doing this, I didn't realize this at first, but as I was preparing this for the night, <laughs> we, right now what we have here is a, uh, I guess, kind of a third-party look at what we're on. One of the disciples is standing there by Jesus and, and taking note of everything that's going on, right? Well, here... We're, we're introduced in verse 14, uh, we're introduced to, to men, an uh, unknown number of men who tended the pigs. So let's take for just a second and let's, let's think about this. You're a member of this community, small town East Texas, okay? And, well, not that. You're, you're one of these men who's up here on the side of this bank and on this hillside, you can see the Sea of Galilee out here. And it's your job to herd these pigs. And you herd these pigs all over town, right? Because you don't turn your cows loose in a pasture all year long. You've got to move them around so the grass grows. So anyway, when you got chose to do the, uh, to do the herding and, and the pigs are over here close to where this crazy man is that lives in the tombs, these tombs are, are cemeteries. So you got this crazy guy that everybody knows about because the town ain't big, I wouldn't imagine anyway. But so 
you're one of you're one of the men and you're on the hillside and you probably heard this guy hooting and hollering for a little bit today and um, you see this boat coming across the water and you holler at your buddy whoever it is out there and hey man you see these guys coming up well yeah it's <laughs> they're headed in the wrong direction that's where where cuckoo lives right over there in the hills and uh you you think about it they're doing their job and they're focusing on their job and they turn back and they're, they're getting pretty close they're gonna find out cuckoo here in a minute you know sure enough i guarantee you, if it was me and one of my buddies i'd have walked up and been like all right 20 bucks says it don't last five minutes on that shoreline till they get back in the boats and they haul butt and so they're sitting there and they're watching and sure enough, here comes a group, about a dozen guys, probably a little bit more, pull up on the shoreline, they get out of the boat, drag it up on the shore, and they hear all crazy, going nuts, and hauling butt out of that, uh, out of that tomb, taking off down the, down the coastline. And then all of a sudden, he stops, hits his knees, and they think, hmm, that's different. You know, like it said up here, he had been bound and broke these chains. He had, uh, nobody was able to subdue him. So they see this. If it was me and I was standing there and my buddy off, or was betting me the money, come on, clock's a ticking, you know? So anyway, um, throughout this conversation that they can't hear, I don't know how far this thing is by any stretch of the imagination, but I think... You know, it would be you know something you could see, probably not anything you could hear. And so these guys are up here on this on this hillside, and they're seeing this crazy man that has always been the crazy guy. He hits his knees in front of this old boy, and they're kind of shocked. And they sit there for about a minute, maybe two, while they have their conversation. And Jesus casts those demons into the pigs that they're supposed to be watching, that they're right here with. And then pigs just go nuts, and they stampede down to the bank and drown themselves. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to freak out. Like, all this just took place, on, and this is a normal, this is a Tuesday, we'll call it, right? And so all this just happened. What do you think they're going to do? Verse 14, the men who tended them ran off and reported to the town and the countryside and the people. Uh, to the countryside, and the people went to see what had happened. Didn't nobody believe them. But would you like to be the guy? 2,000 pigs? I mean, that was, that was food for years. That was food for the town for a year or two. And so would you like to have the popularity of the guys that, that, that let the pigs run off and die? No. So anyway, they went. They did their thing. They told everybody, and everybody couldn't believe it. So they take off to see what had happened. Verse 15. They came to Jesus and saw the man who had been de demon-possessed sitting here, dressed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told, them, and told about the pigs. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their region. As he was getting in the boat, the man who was demon-possessed begged him earnestly that he might remain with him and Jesus did not let him but told him go home to your people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and and how he has had mercy on you so he went out began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and they were all amazed you got a pen or something anybody got a pen pencil no all right I just realized something that I don't want to uh, forget as we go through this. So, back to where I was, where I want to take y'all in this little journey. Let's start in verse three. Three to six is kind of a background on on the man. So, uh, verse one and two kind of opens up the scene, and then there's a backstory that ties right back into it. So anyway, he lived in the tombs and no one was able to restrain him anymore. Anymore means at one point in time they did. At one point in time they could. So his um, issue 
we're going to call it, is where it's something of progression. And this is where I want you to think about all this being small town East Texas, okay? Everybody knows everybody, and if you're from Bullard, everybody knows everybody's business because everybody talks too much. But anyway, um, but at some point in time, this crazy man wasn't a crazy man. He was a boy, and he was normal like any one of us, like anybody that you had ever hoped to meet. And whatever this was, I like to think about this. I, I want to bring this a little bit closer to earth for the rest of us. I want to call this an addiction. I want to call this some kind of a personal problem that me, you, or anybody else in our family might have. So, he lived in the tombs. He was a dead man among dead men. And no one could restrain him anymore. No one could get through to him anymore. At one point in time, maybe he was drinking a little bit too much. Maybe there was that special someone. Maybe it was a girlfriend, a wife, a, a mom or dad could set him down and say, look, man, you're heading down the wrong road and I feel like you need to come to church with us or I feel like you need to straighten up or whatever the case may be. And maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. Maybe he, it says here uh, right after that, no one could restrain him anymore, not even with a chain. What do you do when you're in, when you're in the dire straits of life and say you are a faithful person, you cling to your Bible? with shackles and chains. You don't want to get away from it. Maybe it is a drinking problem. Uh, I know about the uh, the AA thing, the 12-step program. If you're not shackled to it, if, you're not, if that is not your commitment to it, you'll never make it. And same thing with a sinful life with us. If we're not shackled and chained to this, then we never, we'll never get, get free from it. But he, he broke his chains and smashed his shackles what happens when that particular demon whatever it is in our own lives what happens whenever we're weak and and that demon comes along in my life it's been that i dig into the word but eventually i shut it and i put it up and i found myself back into back in the same mess that i got myself in in the first place Breaking the chains, breaking the cycle, getting back into the old habits, and not doing right. No one was strong enough to subdue him anymore. It had gotten to the point that, uh, that was verse 4. No one was strong enough to subdue him anymore. So, <clears throat> no one could get through to him. It didn't matter what anybody said. It didn't matter. It, the, at this point in time, he's homeless, he's helpless, he's hopeless. Outside of Jesus pulling up moments ago, but we're not there yet. He has the, the uh, night and day among the dead. On the mountains, he was crying out, cutting himself with stones, hurting himself, harming himself. When it says cutting himself with stones, let's take, let's take that just for what we're saying here in the story that he was, again, a dead man among dead men, and he was harming himself day and night. But then he met Jesus. He met Jesus. Jesus helped him out. Jesus saved him. And it was his faith that saved him. I want you to jump back to the end here of verse 19. He says, whenever he told him to go back to his people, he said, and how he has had mercy on you. That means if Jesus had mercy on him, he had a reason for it. And his reason for it was that it's pro you've probably been on the wrong road for a long time. Jesus had mercy on me, and I had been there for many years. But... What I want you to get out of this, oh, wait a minute. So what happens when he meets Jesus? He accepts Jesus. 
The demons are gone. He is <clears throat> He has accepted him. Jesus gave him peace mentally, spiritually, physically, clothed him in righteousness so he could send send the man back out into the battlefield to proclaim the gospel. He was in verse 19 when Jesus wouldn't let him because you would think, you know, Jesus called the tax collector, the sinners, the everybody. He called them to him and they walked with him. Even the ones that were following him, they came along just as Jesus was going. They came along and he allowed them to go with them. But he didn't let this man. But just like the blind man that we talked about and the, the crippled man that we talked about last week, those people were well known. If there was a naked crazy man living out in the woods here in Bullard, everybody would know about it. And that's exactly what this man was. And everybody would know you stay away from this area because you don't want to run into that guy. But now this man has been made whole. This man has is, is given a brand new life. He's not that person anymore, just like all the rest of us are. The old man is dead, right? And the new man lives on. He says, go home to your own people, those dead men we were talking about earlier, and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. How much he has done for you as far as the taking care of you, healing you from all your ailments, picking you up when your butt ought to have been left in the ditch. He has had mercy on you. Go and proclaim. What I want every one of y'all to see is yourself in this story. We have all been that man. And we all have, we all had demons to fight. I mean, the, 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 the thing about us, when we, when we come to salvation, when we repent and we go to the cross and we give our life to Christ, we put everything out there. You're supposed to boldly put everything at the cross and leave it there. But we live in a fallen world. And in this fallen world, when we get up and we walk away, those things follow us around. Anybody here that's ever fought with addiction, which we all have, will know that. There's always something chasing you. But he found salvation in Christ and had been commanded to go and proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth, just like we have. Now, Jesus done got in his boat and he done left at this point and I'm talking to all y'all too he went and he left just to do just that proclaim the gospel what about you are you still on the beach are you still hanging out still waiting on a sunny day to get, get in there and proclaim the gospel to take what we're talking about here and what we talk about every Sunday what you read about hopefully daily in, this, in the Bible are you sitting on the beach waiting? Are you out there proclaiming the gospel? At least saying a good word. It's just the, the Kara, that one right over there, digging in her ear. I'm calling you out. Kara came to me one day, or either either she came to me or, or I was where she was working at the time. She was going through a hard time one day, and it was just tears built up in her eyes, and she was trying to do her job, and and a man told her, just stranger, never seen him before in her life. It's going to be okay. Whatever it is, don't worry about it. It's going to be all right. And that's one of those God sent things. Just a kind word to somebody anywhere at any point in time. That's how we're known. And that's what we're supposed to do. So that finishes us up for tonight. That finishes up our study of the miracles. There's a lot of miracles, and I still don't understand why John only put seven. I mean, you go through, I think there's closer to 40 um, throughout the Gospels, but thousands and thousands and thousands of people that were healed that couldn't possibly be healed. People that, that were, I guess, what would you say, exercised, I guess, 
the the miracles of the calm in the winds and the waves and the feeding of the 5,000, just the everything. He had thousands of followers at one time. At the feeding of the 5,000, I think we kind of estimated around 25, 30. We don't know, but you can say that there was a wife for every man, and that's 10,000. Maybe two more, two kids per, and that's another 10,000. Maybe a couple of them had mother-in-laws or cousins or somebody with them. That's a handful of more. The number keeps adding up. He did all this for all these people. And the day that he was crucified, most all of them were calling for it. So, anyway, I hope you all enjoyed the, the going over those miracles. And I hope that everybody got something out of what we went over tonight. And, you know, like Daryl was, was talking about up here, stepping on toes. I don't want to make anybody mad, but I hope I'm making you look in the mirror. I hope I'm making y'all think through what what life really is and what it really means. So, anybody got any questions or anything? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, so you got to think about this. What are demons really? They're fallen angels. So they all knew Jesus long before we this world was ever created, right? So, um, and that's something else. We can look at that real quick. In that discourse, calling him the son of the most high God, that is the highest title Jesus could be called. So they knew exactly who he was. They knew the power that they that he had. And all they could do, run straight up to him, get down on their knees, and because they had to obey him. There was, they, they had absolutely no power over him. They had no options whatsoever. So when it, sa when it says that, what do you have to do? What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? You can jump down to verse 8 and say what Jesus said. Come out of that man, you unclean spirit. And then jump back up to seven and, and to pick up where you left off. I beg you before God, do not torment me. And that's when Jesus asked him, when, uh, what's your name? So you ever been mad? You ever been at Taco Bell or somewhere and been mad at the service? Like, I want to see your manager. You know, I'm going to know your name and I want to see your manager. You know, that was that was Jesus right then and there. I want to know who you are. Tell me who's in there. You know, get out. But anyway, anything else? Dave told me something Monday night that um, I, I had planned on working in here, and I never did. But um, Monday night, I had an issue with what we were going over. I couldn't wrap my head around exactly... You, I followed the story all the way up to about the last third of it. And I could not wrap my head around exactly what it was saying because my, my head was saying one thing and the word was saying another. So I left it up for discussion. And so as we discussed it, Dave, being the wise man that he is, he looks at me and says, man, we got to keep focused on the point. We can't get lost in the, in the details. And that's exactly true. We have to keep focused on the point, just like Mary and Martha, and they should have kept focused on Jesus and what he was there to do. But I truly believe, and Dave's right 100%, but when you dig into these little details, if you don't see yourself, you're not digging hard enough. You need to see yourself, because if you don't recognize and you don't, you don't realize your faults, you don't recognize them, and you can't change them. And if you don't change them, you'll be this guy that we just read about in Mark 5. So, anything else from anybody? Right. 
That's right. Yes, I agree. You know, when we came to when when you come to the cross of salvation, your your sins are gone as far as the east is from the west. He he has forgiven all that. And his grace and mercy is fresh every day. So you're you're very right. Good point. Well, if that's all, we'll uh, let's pray real quick and we'll get on home. Father God, again, I thank you so much for everybody that you've brought here tonight. I thank you for the wonderful day that we've had. I thank you for all your blessings, all the ones that we see here, and more importantly, the ones that we don't see. You keep us from destruction every day, if not every moment of that day. You are the sustainer of everything that we know, and without you, there is nothing. So, Father, I just pray that you touch the hearts of each and every one here tonight, that you walk with us, that you go with us as we leave here, that you put somebody in our path that we can say a kind word to, that we can, we can, we can spread, we can proclaim the gospel to. We can do what you called us to do when you forgave, forgave us those sins. Father, watch over us. Um, we lift all those up that are on our prayer list there's a lot of pain in this world there's a lot of hurting in this world there's a lot of confusion in this world and we're right here slap in the middle of pride month of all things and father I just pray that everybody in this world realize the first sin that was ever committed was Satan was Lucifer's pride and that's what got him cast out and here it is again creeping up on us Father, I pray that you give us the courage to stand up when, we, when we're forced to, to stand up and stand out for you. Give us the courage and the discernment to stand in the gap. Be with us for all of this and, all, and everything that you've got for us in the future. And may we trust, uh, trust completely and totally in your plan and your timing for our testimony. In Jesus' name, amen.